We've been in a series called Blessable and uh, been talking about the heart posture, the heart condition that attracts the blessing and the favor of God. Again, the blessing of God is not earned. It's not deserved. It's not something we pay for. But God is a person. He has a personality. Not a human, but he's a person. And he is drawn to um, a heart posture of humility, integrity, and generosity. And over the last uh, few weeks, we've talked about humility and integrity. Today, we're going to talk about generosity. And uh, I just want to remind you again what the blessing of God is. This word blessing from the Bible means a declaration of divine favor, imploring divine favor on someone or something. It is a declaration of happiness, a means of happiness that promotes prosperity and welfare as a gift. Anybody want that? Come on, promotes prosperity and welfare as a gift. I've said it like this, the blessing of God is like the wind at your back. It's just it's, it's pushing you forward at a pace and at a strength that you just couldn't do on your own. It's, it's not you doing it. It's God doing it. That is the blessing of God. That's where I want to live. I don't want to live bound to my talent, my hustle, my grind, uh, my ability. I, I need the blessing of God to do for me what I cannot do for myself. Amen. That's what we're talking about. And so uh, today we are going to talk about generosity. This is Isaiah 32, verse 8. But a generous man or woman devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. A generous man devises generous things or generous plans. He thinks about, he plans his generosity, and by generosity he shall stand. I want to talk today about being intentionally generous. Intentionally generous. Gener- you will not be generous by accident. Can I tell you that? Hello. Good morning. You just won't be. You just won't be. You've got to be intentionally generous. Father, thank you for your word now. I pray that you would speak to us in a very clear and profound way. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, that we've, we've learned generosity for you, from you. It was God that so loved the world that gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Thank you for being generous. And we want to emulate that in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen and amen. I don't know who I hugged out there, but I got fur and Lord help me. Okay. Uh, I've been, I've been trying to eat better, more ice cream, more dessert, more, just better. Just trying to be me. Just trying to do me. No, uh, cut gluten and sugar out of my diet. It's been really challenging, but it's really helped me. It makes me feel a lot better. And so I uh, went to uh, take Goldie to lunch, and her favorite food on the planet is Chick-fil-A. Amen. She's very spiritual. She's very in tune. She understands <laughs> Jesus' chicken and its blessing. And so we got her the nuggets. We got her the fries. And then I got a salad with grilled chicken. And it was good. It was good. It was good. It's good. <laughs> wasn't a chicken sandwich, but it was good. And um, I, I say, we're, we're, we're there at the, at the table, and I, I, I say, Goldie, let me have a fry. And I start to reach, and she just grabs her fry box, and she goes, no thanks. <laughs> and I go, Goldie, please, let me have a fry. It's okay, Dad. It's okay. <laughs> I say, Goldie, I'm going to eat a fry. So I reached over and I grabbed that fry. I ate that fry and she just broke down, started crying, <laughs> called the police. <laughs> and um, it just was so devastated that I ate the fry. I, you know, she's four years old now. She has still, still never walked up to me with her favorite present, her favorite gift, her favorite toy. She still never walked up to me and handed it to me and said, Yours. Still hasn't happened. She's getting better. She's getting more generous, but she's still not. Yours. No, she, she holds that thing and she says, mine. It's mine. Try to take your iPad away from your child today and just see what <laughs> happens to them. Yeah. And, and what I wanted to tell Goldie is, hey, babe, those fries, they're mine. They're my fries. I paid for them. They're mine. <laughs> the house we're eating, this is mine. It's my house. That table, that's my table. That seat, it's my seat. It's 
Those are my fries. That's my chicken nuggets. I'm not going to eat them because I'm gluten-free, but those are my nuggets. <laughs> That's what I want to tell my four-year-old. Have you ever tried to have an adult conversation with your four-year-old and they just... <sighs> and when God asks us for something, he's not asking us for something that isn't his. <laughs> he goes, those are my fries, dog. <laughs> give, me, give me one of those. And so when we talk about generosity, we're simply giving back to God what he is allowing us to steward. The Bible mentions love 714 times. Uh, believe 272 times. Pray 371 times. Give 2,152 times. Why? Because our God is love and love always gives. And therefore the greatest calling of God is to be generous just like our Father. So generous means a person showing a readiness to give more of something than is strictly necessary or expected. There's this, there's this thing in me that is looking for ways to give more than would be necessary or expected. Now that word in the Hebrew language means to be inclined. That, that word inclined means lean. Your, your bent is not take, your bent is give. Your lean is not, how can I get more? Your lean is, how can I give more? It is a willingness. It is a readiness. Literally, generosity in the Hebrew language is a readiness. I'm just ready. Lord, what do you want to do? The answer is yes. Whatever, whatever you're about to tell me, the answer is already yes. That's generosity. So Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 41, this is from the message. If someone takes unfair advantage of you, use the occasion to practice the servant life. Now, you've heard that in the original uh, translations that says, go the extra mile. What does Jesus say, go the extra mile? Because in those days, a Roman soldier could tell you to carry their armor for them. And they could just walk up to you. They would be picking on you. They'd say, carry my armor. I don't want to carry it right now. And you had to carry it. Jesus says, when they ask you to do that, don't just walk with them for a mile. Go ahead and do two miles. Now, look what he says. No more tit for tat stuff. Live generously. See, I don't think the opposite of generosity is necessarily greed. I think it can be the refusal to lean. Oh, out of sight, out of mind. If, if I don't see it, they don't see it. If, I'm not, if, if I don't think about it, it's not real. Huh. See, listen, we should always use wisdom in life. I'm not asking you to purposely be taken advantage of that would be ridiculous but hear that this is really strong if you live a life that is constantly a fear of being taken advantage of where you're constantly afraid of being taken advantage of you will never step into generosity you'll never live on the defense and be generous <laughs> so here's a Here's a good question to ask. Here's a good question to ask. How can I monetize my gifts, my talents, and my abilities? How can I monetize it? How can I use the things that I'm good at to make money? That's a good thing to do. If you could ever use your gifts, talents, and abilities and make money doing that, that's a, that's a great way to live. A lot of people don't get to do that. So a good question to ask. A great question to ask. How can I monetize my gifts, my talents, and abilities? Here's a better question to ask. How can I give away more of my gifts, talents, and abilities? How can I give it, how can I give it away? How can I help more people? How can, I, how can I make a greater impact? Not just how can I make money, how can I be a blessing? One will create an income, the other creates a legacy. And I'm not here, I am not on this earth just to create an income. Just to die one day and give Goldie a couple hundred grand in a life insurance policy. I am here to create a legacy. And I'm not going to create a legacy by taking. I'm going to create a legacy by giving. I am not a brand that makes money. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have gifts, I have talents, and I have abilities. And thank God he allows me to also make that my living. But listen, I am always looking for ways. How can I give away? How can I serve more people? How can I, how can I do more to reach more people? Because I'm not just 
focused on an income. I'm focused on a legacy. I'm not just focused on making a living. I'm focused on making a giving. So the question is motive. The motive is not can I, how can I get more? The motive is how can I give more? That's a generous person. I'm thinking about it. I'm planning it. That's a generous man devising generous plans. And by his generosity, he will stand. That word stand means to be established, secure, and grounded. Listen, I know millionaires that are afraid of losing it all. I know people who make so much money and yet constantly live in the fear of, is it all going to go away? But the Bible says if you'll be generous, you'll be able to stand. You'll be secure. You'll be grounded. You'll be established. You won't live in the fear of losing it. I want to live intentionally generous. So here's, here's four ways that we can be intentionally generous. Don't worry, the whole message isn't just about money. Everyone relax. Number one, be generous with your time. Time is precious. Time is a gift. We should never be wasting time or killing time. What do you have to ask killing time? You shouldn't be killing time. It's a precious gift God gives us. Psalm 90 verse 12 says, teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. Teach us to number. God, life is short. Help me to make an impact. Help me to, help me to be generous with my time. Now when, I, when, I, when we say generous, again, we're saying going beyond what is necessary. So I'm saying go beyond what is necessary with your time. Let me just give you a few. I'm going to meddle with you a little bit, okay? I'm just going to be a little bit annoying, but because I love you. You don't have to see me for a week. Uh, be generous with your time at work. Hey. Arrive early, stay late. No one gets there early. Be generous. My boss doesn't even get there early. Be generous. No one in my, no one in my organization gets there early. Be generous. <laughs> Just show up early. No one cares. God does. No one sees it. God does. I told you just a little bit. I'm going to be out of your hair for six days. You will not have to see me again until next week. Be early. Show up early. Don't show up 10 minutes late with a coffee in your hand. Well, the traffic. There's no traffic. We live in Vegas. There's no traffic. Learn to be generous with your time. Get there early. Show up. Come fresh, come ready to go, come ready to work. Clock in a few minutes early. Oh, I'm not going to get paid for that. That's okay. You're doing it for God. You're doing it to be a testimony. You're doing it to be a light. <sighs> so I'm generous with my time at work. I stay late. I don't, I don't spend the last 30 minutes with my laptop open just staring. 4.58. 4.59. Five. I'm out. Because your boss isn't paying you to stare at the clock for the last hour. Do something. <laughs> I'm talking about being blessable. Because God sees this stuff. God sees, God sees this stuff. God sees this stuff. Okay, moving on. How about time with your family? How many know you can be somewhere physically but not be there mentally, not be there emotionally, not be there spiritually? So when you're at dinner with your family, around the table, and I encourage you to do that, I encourage you to make that happen at least a few days a week where you all sit down together and eat together, put your phones away. Because if you're sitting there eating together on your phone, you're not eating together. You're eating with your Instagram friends. You're eating with TikTok. <laughs> you're eating with Facebook. Nothing good on Facebook. Nothing. Still not found one good thing on Facebook. <sighs> so... That, no, I'm, you engage. Engage. Engage with your time. I've heard it said that your children spell love, T-I-M-E. Your kids want time. And, and like for my little four-year-old, she wants quality time. Quality time means I give her attention. So I'll be cooking. I'll be doing something around the house. I'll be busy. And she'll go, Dad, look at me. <laughs> and it may be a new outfit. She just... She may have a new dance move, which is basically just 
flailing around the house, you know. It might be a new little thing on her little scooter. Look at me! That's what she wants. She wants attention. That's time. And, and your 12-year-old may not say it, but they're saying, look at me. And your 16-year-old is too cool to say it, but they're saying, look at me. And for some of you, you have adult children, and you're waiting for them to call you, but they're waiting for you to call them because they're just going, look at me. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about quality time. I'm talking about I am going beyond what is expected and necessary. I'm talking about time. I'm talking about giving time. I'm talking about being generous with my time. Time at church. That's why we call people to serve. I'm never apologize. I've always thanked people for serving. I've never apologized for people serving. Because serving in church is absolutely vital to your Christian walk. Because it connects you to something bigger than yourself. It connects you to something greater than just kind of going through the rat race of, of life every week. It connects you to serving people. It connects you to something that you are accountable to that you don't get paid for. Right? Because we go back to everything is about monetization. Everything's about how do I make money. There, there are certain things that we should do as a gift. Time with God. Be generous with your time with God. What does that mean? It means God gets the best of you. When are you the best? That's the time God should get. I'm going to read my Bible right before I go to bed, and you're going to nod off reading Psalm 23. Like, you're not going to get anything. When are you fresh? When are you sharp? That's when you should, that's when you should give God time. I'm talking about being generous with your time. All right, number two. That one went over like a lead balloon. Let's keep moving. Number two. Generous with your encouragement. <laughs> Are you glad that I like tell you what you need to hear, not just what you want to? Like, because I could, I could get up here every week and just preach you on your feet. This is your season. Ah! I could do it. It would be really hard on me, but I could do it. It would be hard on my voice, but I could do it. And y'all would love it, and then you would your life would fall apart on Monday. So I'm just trying to help you. You're like, man, that was a word. What are you talking about? I don't know, but it was fire. <laughs> trying to help you live, okay? I'm trying to help you live. Trying to help you get a raise at work, okay? Number two, number two, generous with your encouragement. Acts 4.36, Joseph was a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, OMG. Imagine having such a great attitude that your friends have to rename you. They go, Dad, we can't call you Joe no more. We got to call you Barnabas. You're just an encourager. We got to call you encourager. You're the encourager. You're the man. You're the... Imagine if your friends spoke to your attitude to your face and it was positive instead of behind your back and it's negative. Yo, she's drama, dog. Just be careful. Just... He's kind of like, don't give out my number. Like, he's kind of. How about we go the other way, where it's actually positive, where, where people go, my gosh, you're just so encouraged. I just got to call you encourager. You're just the greatest. You're just unbelievable at it. You're just awesome at it. You just make me, you just make me feel good. You make me feel like I can change the world. Encouragement. I've been thinking about this question. Why, why does criticism hit so much harder than encouragement? Like, I'll, I'll, I'll post a little sermon clip on my Instagram, and I'll get 50 comments like, fire, awesome, emojis, you know? And then I'll get some, you know, Instagram Bible theologian wannabe. Well, you took that scripture out of context, and it actually meant, yes, you used the message translation? That's like not even a translation. That's how I hear them talking. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as one meme put it, all of your haters are sitting on a toilet criticizing you, right? I just can't believe you would just... Yeah, that's a... He's the message, it's Eugene Peterson. He's not even, it's not even translated. Because you know Greek and Hebrew, right? And you know... <laughs> no, but I watched the YouTube clip that said that it's only the King James, and that's what we should, because I watch YouTube. Okay, well, go get a doctorate and then come tell me. So here's the deal. See, I'm all flustered about it. <laughs> Those people. Lock. Here's the deal. 
here's, here's, but here's why, here's why it's like so real to me right now. Because criticism is always so specific. Encouragement is usually so vague. So criticism is you do this and you always do this and you never do this and you always say that and you never say that and you never. And it cuts. And then encouragement is like, hey, good job. So you have to learn the art. Let me help you now. Ooh, married couples. Oh, I'm going to help you. <laughs> Gentlemen, I'm going to help you tonight. <laughs> learn the art. If you got kids in here, we got a kids ministry. Learn the art of specific encouragement. It's a little awkward at first, but it's, it's real. Specific encouragement. So when, when she says, how do I look? You don't go, it's good, it's good, it's good. You like my new hair? It's good. And then you wonder why at night you go, you want to do it? And she goes, no, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. But you're good. It's good. It's good. It's good. Hey. Hey. And she's like, no, dog. You got to learn how to. So you look at your wife and go, I'm going to start with the hair. We're going to go all the way down. <laughs> Fire. What'd you do? Wash it? What'd you do? <laughs> Come on, ladies. I know that's hard to do. Why is this so shiny? I washed it. Oh, my God. I can't believe you. Oh, I can tell. It ain't all greasy. Oh, I love this. It's all clean. Smell good. Woo. Eyebrows. Love it. New color? What'd you do? Make them a little thicker? Lashes. Those yours? Whose are the Man, fire. What'd you do with your lips? Are those fillers? What'd you do? No, I just kind of got a little brighter around with the liner. I just kinda, ooh, I love it. Girl, you waxed that lip for me? Did you wax that for me, girl? You know when you... I'm going to stop there. I'm getting into my relationship series now a little bit, but I'm just trying to be specific. Listen, give your kids specific encouragement. I tell my little four-year-old, she's just four. I go, you sing so good. No, she doesn't. She doesn't. But I'm speaking those things that are not as though they were. I'm like, you sing so good. Oh, my gosh, you play that guitar so good. She just got a little fake Elsa guitar, you know. You're so good. Like, I know. You dance so well. How'd you learn it? I did that class, and they taught me, oh, my God, just specific encouragement. You got to learn how to give specific encouragement because specific criticism is going to come. So it has to be specific encouragement. Learn the art. Proverbs 18, 21. Someone's like, we need more of the Bible. Here we go. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and those who love it will eat its fruit. Ephesians 4, 29. Don't use foul or abusive language. Let everything you say be good and helpful so that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear him. Here's a, little, here's a little acronym from Nikki Gumbel. I love this. Before you speak, think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Before you speak, think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? We're talking about being generous with our Encouragement, number three, generous with our honor. Romans 12.10 says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. This word honor means to give value to something or to give weight to it. Now, why, why does it mean to give weight to? Because in ancient culture, you, you couldn't just pay with coins. You had, to, you had to weigh them out because every coin could be a little bit different. It wasn't paper money, obviously, back then or, or whatever we have now. So every coin could be weighted a little bit different. So some gold coins could be worth more because of the weight. So what they would do, they wouldn't just count it. They would weigh it. And the heavier it was, the more valuable it was. And so what the Bible is saying is it's saying give weight to people. In other words, see their value. See the value in others. See the weight in others. In other words, we don't take people lightly. 
We don't blow people off. We're not rude. We're not mean. We don't gossip because we honor them. We see the, the weight. This word honor comes from the uh, Hebrew word kavod, which is the same for glory. We see the glory that God has placed on you. You're made in the image of God. You're not an animal. Man, I don't know if you know that. You're not an animal. You're made in the image of God. I was so proud of Goldie this week. We were watching some demonic cartoon that we let her watch. And they said, and humans are animals. And she said, Dad, humans aren't animals. I said, you are right. Filled with the Holy Ghost. Look at this little four-year-old telling me that. I said, you're right. We are not animals. I see the glory on you. I see the weight that God is in. You're made in the image and likeness of God. Therefore, I honor you. I honor you for who you are, and I'm not going to get caught up on who you're not. That's honor. So in, in Genesis 9, crazy story, uh, Noah is celebrating that he's gotten off the boat. And uh, he, he, gets, he gets a little excited, and he, he just passes out drunk. And the Bible says that he drank and drank, and he ended up going into a stupor. He ended up falling asleep on his bed, totally naked. And his son Ham walks into the tent and sees his father naked. Now what Noah has done is shameful, it's embarrassing, and it's wrong. But the Bible says that Ham went out to his brother and said, man, he'll never believe. You got to go check out dad. He's just laying in there naked. Dad again just, and he's, he's dishonoring his father. The other two brothers run to the tent. But the Bible says they grab a blanket and they turn around backwards against their father to not see him. They cover themselves with a blanket. They walk up to their father's bed and they lay the blanket over their father so that they would not see his nakedness. They honored their father. See, what Noah did was shameful and stupid. But what Ham did was dishonorable. And God did not judge Noah for having too much wine, but he judged Ham for dishonoring his father. What am I saying? I'm, I'm not saying that we should honor at all costs and if you're in a relationship that's abusive or violent or that you, oh, I just need, I guess I just need to honor my, no, that's not what I'm talking about. But what I am saying is I want to make this super clear. This is, this you just got to commit to this if you're going to be in relationships. If you're in relationships with people long enough, you're going to see the worst in them. Hello. You're going to see the worst in them. And you have to choose to cover and not expose. You have to choose to honor and not shame. You have to choose to speak life to and not just. And the, and the, and the Bible said that they covered their father. 1 Samuel 24, the Bible says that Saul wanted to kill David. David was on the run. He was running from this madman named King Saul who God had rejected. And the Bible says that Saul went into a cave to use the restroom. And while Saul was using the restroom, David actually, uh, David's men actually said, God, uh, David, Saul's there. He's, he's exposed. He's using the restroom. He's, this is your moment. God has given him into your hands. Go kill him. And David said, I will not touch the Lord's anointed. Here's the, cool, here's the crazy thing. Saul wasn't the Lord's anointed. God had already rejected him. But David said, I'm not going to dishonor anyone that God has ever called. Oh. So the Bible says he snuck up behind him while he was going to the restroom and he cut off a piece of his clothing. And then he ran far away and he held it up in his hand and he said, he said Saul, Saul, I could have killed you, but I don't want to kill you. I want to cover you. I love you. I, I don't want to do this. And, and the Bible says that Saul tried to kill him again. It's honor. We're being generous with our honor. The Bible said in Mark 6 that Jesus could do no mighty miracles in his hometown. Because they looked at him and said, oh, he's just a carpenter's son. You can never receive some, from someone who you don't honor. You can never receive from someone who you don't honor. You can never receive from someone that you don't honor. <clears throat> well, they're not honorable. Well, neither was Saul. Well, they're not honorable. Well, neither was Noah. But I'm honorable. I don't honor you because you're honorable. I honor you because I'm honorable. Yeah. 
All right. Keep it moving, Jabin. Okay, let me keep it moving. So we honor each other. We honor the Lord. We honor authority. 1 Timothy 5.17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church are worthy of double honor, especially those who work, whose work excuse me, is preaching and teaching. We honor leadership. And, and I never make a big deal about it. You know, church is three years old. We've never even celebrated Pastor's Appreciation Month. We've never celebrated my birthday or Shannon's birthday. Like, we don't make a big deal about that kind of stuff. We probably should. We probably should do a better job of that. We, we don't, but, um, but I would say this, that there has to be an honor in your heart for what God has put on me, or you'll just never be able to receive from me. So I've never been the guy to go, I'm the man of God, I'm the pastor. I'm the, I've never told people what to do. I've never had, no one in this room has ever carried my bag. Or I'm just, but... For you to be able to receive from a house, there has to be a level of honor. Or I'll just preach and it'll just go in here one out the other and it just, you'll, you'll never get anything from it. Number four, generous with our finance. Look at 2 Samuel 24, 24. I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God burnt offerings that cost me nothing. Let me just give you a little bit of background here. David is out on the battlefield. He has to give God an offering. He wants to give God an offering, but he needs a certain kind of field to offer this offering to the Lord. So he finds a field that'll work for him. He goes to the man who owns the field, and he says, hey, I need to buy this field from you so I can give to the Lord. And the Bible said that when the man recognized him, he recognized that he's the king of Israel, right? And he goes, he goes sir, I, I cannot sell you this field. You've got to take this field. This is, this is yours. You're the king. And David said, no, no, no I have to pay for it. It's not about you, it's about God. I, I've got to give God something, and it has, if it doesn't cost me anything, it's, it's not worship, it's not generosity. So he says, I'm not going to give God anything that doesn't cost me anything. See, if it never costs you anything, it's not generosity. Time, honor, encouragement, money, doesn't matter what it is. If, if it doesn't cost me, if it doesn't cause some humility to rise up in my heart, it's not really generosity. There's an awesome lady in our church uh, who she serves and gives. And she's just amazing, huge blessing to us. And she reached out this week and she said, hey, what's the, what's the monthly budget of City Light? Like, what does it cost to keep this thing going? And uh, we said, well, what, why, why do you want to know? And she goes, well, I'm putting it in my, in my vision board. I'm putting it down in my journal. She goes, you know, I know Jabin always says, you know, we don't have some millionaire big bucks that like pays for everything. She goes, but I want to, I want to be the person to pay for everything. See, because a generous man has a generous plan. So she goes, I want to, I want to put this, I want to, I want to build my faith to be able to go, okay, if it costs that, that's what I want to pay. That's what I want to give. And, um, and we said, well, you know, it's kind of uncomfortable. Ah, well, this is what like the building costs that. Let me just tell you, there was, there's something in her that says, I want to I give at that level. There's, there's, some, there was, there's something in her that goes, what's the budget? Let me help cover it. You know, I had a friend this year in, in Houston, Texas, who as COVID was happening and all that, uh, a man walked into his office and said, what does it cost to, to run the church? Just what does it cost? And he goes, well, it costs this much a month. And a, a businessman that he did not know wrote him a check for all of 2020 because he said, I, I don't want you worrying about the bills in 2020. And I want you to just focus on ministry. Because a generous man devises a generous plan. And, by his, and I'm not, you know, I, I couldn't do that. You, maybe you can't do that. I'm just saying there's something, there was something in the, in the man's heart. Maybe as I'm even saying this, you're like, you're spiritually being going, I'd love to be that. Listen, get a, gener- if you're, get a generous plan. Yeah. Maybe you can't do it today. Maybe you can do it in 10 years. Maybe you can do it in five years. There was just something in her that just said, I just want, I just, I don't want you guys to worry about that. And David said, it's got to cost me something. Okay, now let me show you this. Gnarly scripture, James chapter 1. I'm almost done. Y'all okay? Y'all okay? James chapter 1, verse 10. Those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them, 
they will fade away like a flower in the field. OMG, James was... James was in a bad mood when he wrote that or something. Uh, James is not saying that wealth is bad or that being rich is bad. Because you can read that scripture and you can have two wrong thoughts. First wrong thought is, see, wealth is bad. We should never want to be rich. Number two, the, the other wrong way to read that is to go, well, I'm not rich like Elon Musk. I can't be greedy. I'm not rich like Bill Gates. Does that make sense? Because yeah. we, we can just find someone who has more money than us. Why don't those people do more with, well, what are you doing? Yeah. See, but we can always find, yeah. Here, here's what James is saying. Be humble about anything that God gives you. Just be humble. Just, just treat finance with humility. Here's, here's what that means for me. It means, Lord, it's all yours. You're letting me steward it. It all belongs to you. Lead me, guide me, show me, direct me, and I'm going to do it. That's humility. Not money is bad. Not I wish I was rich like somebody else. Just whatever you have given me, let me steward it and let me treat it with humility. Because in Mark chapter 10, Jesus said, it's really hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. I love Peter's response because he's just so freaked out. He goes, Lord, we've, we've given all to serve you. Why? Because Peter had money. Peter was a business owner. In other words, Peter's like, are we good? Am I in? And Jesus said, guys, guys, anyone who's given up anything for the kingdom, anyone who's sowed anything for the kingdom, they will reap 100-fold in this life and in the life to come. Here's what Jesus was saying. Peter, you're good because you're generous. Ah, see, generosity makes money a tool instead of a God. Generosity puts money in its proper place. It's not God, it's a tool. It's not my source, God is my source. It's simply a tool that God has given me that I steward. And you might have to steward 30,000 a year, 300,000 a year, 300 million a year. That, I don't know what you make, but you have to steward that. And it's okay to have things. It's okay to have a, a, drive a safe car, live in a safe neighborhood. It's, all of that's okay. But listen, you can have things, just make sure things don't have you. Don't find your identity in it. Don't find your security in it. Proverbs 10, 15 says that wealth is a fortress. And it is. It, it does make life easier. But the way that wealth remains a fortress and not an idol oh, is generosity. I, I, I can remember hearing Dave Ramsey saying, you don't have to live paycheck to paycheck. And I'm like, who is this guy? <laughs> you need a $1,000 emergency fund and then a six-month emergency fund and then you need to get out of debt. And, then, and I remember hearing Dave say all that. I'm like, Dave, you tripping, dog? <laughs> you know what? Now, now we're there. It is, wealth is a fortress. I thank God for it. But it's not God. Right. And what, what makes sure it's not God is my generosity. Okay, so here's how, I treat, here's how I treat money. I live below my means, number one. If you spend everything you bring in, uh, yeah, but Jabin, I don't make, you can live below your means. Yeah. You can. I can help you if you want to open up your account to me. I'll show you how you can. You can do it. I'll start chopping stuff out of your budget so fast you won't know what hits you. <laughs> you can live below your means. It'll be uncomfortable, but you can live below your means. You're going to have to eat at home, but you can live below your means. You're going to have to cut cable and internet, but you can live below your means. You're going to have to turn in your car, but you can live below your means. Well, okay. <laughs> Once you start living below your means, you start saving aggressively. You invest wisely, and you give generously. That's how I live. That is how I live my life. I live below my means. And I save aggressively, I invest wisely, and I give generously. I want us to be a generous church. With our time, with our encouragement, with our honor, with our finance, in every area, generosity means God, the answer is yes, before you even ask. That's generosity. 
Generosity is not me taking. Generosity is me giving. Generosity is not a lean towards, I think you're trying to take advantage of me and I'm going to keep all that I can get. Generosity is how can I give to create a legacy? In every area, every area of my life, not just one, every area of my life. And the Bible said, Proverbs 11, I'll end with this, the world of the generous is just getting larger and larger. Every area, not not just money, every area. I just live a generous life and life gets bigger. Perspective gets bigger. Dreams get bigger. Prayers get bigger. Faith gets bigger. Impact gets bigger. Legacy gets bigger. So I'm not living a small, all about me life. I'm living a life that is creating not just income for me, which is great, but legacy for my family. I'm done. Can you say amen to the word today? I hope it helped you. I hope it helped you.